Well, let's, let's see where we've come. Um, so far, we've talked about the beginnings. What are some of the highlights about the beginnings? Creation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. That's right. 
Absolutely. So Moses said, starts leading him out, and the Egyptians change their mind and come after him, and they meet him at the Red Sea. And what is what happens? He parts, he parts the Red Sea. One of the coolest scenes on TV, even without CGI. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I like how they did it. Actually, it's really cool. Um, they get through the Red Sea and they head straight for. Do I remember? Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. They go straight to Mount Sinai, and when they get to Mount Sinai, Moses goes up again, because that's where God met him the first time. And this time God tells him, the Ten Commandments. He gives him the laws for his people. So he's built up a, a nation of people. He's rescued them out of Egypt. He's, kept, he's got them all together in one place, and now he's giving them his law to tell them how to live. Okay. Who's going who's gonna to impress me? By knowing the Ten Commandments. Uh, uh, we might know, but we can't One God. No idols. No idols. Name in vain. No, don't take God's name in vain. Ooh, he's on a roll over here. Sabbath. Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy? Honor your father and your mother. Don't kill. Don't kill. Don't kill. Don't kill. Don't kill. Adultery. Adultery, no adultery. Hey. Don't kill. No, 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 no steal. steal. Think of the octopus. No, no, steal. no, no steal. steal. No steal. Nine. No, 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 I couldn't point out the fact that y'all say the magic sun I'm trying to remember. Number nine is when you, like, you, you're, you're playing um, golf on nine holes and you lie about your score. Thou shalt not lie and ten. Yeah. Y'all are, that's good. We're getting there. You are getting there. I'm impressed. Very, very good. You have this little passion. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 got one more lead, right? Yeah. So God gives them the, the Ten Commandments, and almost immediately they blow it. Yeah. They, um, Moses stays gone a little too long. They get nervous, so what do they do? They, they, they make it all they have. They're not used to worshiping a God they can't see. So they, they want something they can see and touch, and they make the, the, the golden calf, and God doesn't like that very much. So he takes them to the promised land. Oh, wait, one more thing. The covenant God makes with them in giving them Ten Commandments, he says, I'm going, you're going to be a treasured possession to me, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. In other words, they're going to be saints. Saints are special, set apart, blessed, sanctified people. So he's making his people into saints right here at Mount Sinai. So they, they go to the promised land, they get there, didn't take them too long, and they send how many spies? Do you remember? Three. Twelve spies. And they get ten good reports and two bad ones. No. No. I'm sorry. No. Other way around. Ten bad reports and two, two good ones. And they choose to believe the bad ones. So God gives them another 40 years to think about. And they get back to the promised land. And who is the leader this time when they get there the second time? Joshua. Joshua. Moses has died. The first generation of everybody who left uh, Egypt has died. So we've got Joshua and Caleb, the two good spies. Well, didn't Joshua go the first time? Was he, he was one of the two good so spies. So he was an older little dude. But he, he was. He was. Yeah, he was. He was in the spring. <coughs> oh, absolutely. So Joshua leads them into the promised land. And he sends some spies himself the second time. He sends, I think it was three, right? Yeah, three. But he didn't tell anybody. He didn't keep it to himself this time. He'd already learned from the mistakes. The three, the three said, go. God's got this. And where's the first place they send him in the promised land? Jericho. Jericho. And God gives him a really interesting battle plan. Walk around the city. Walk around the city. Which we now know also is kind of a, a biblical way of claiming something. When you circle it, you're claiming it. And they're claiming it for God. And he told them to just walk around it for six days. And on the seventh day, they walked around it how many times? Seven, 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 seven times. times. And then they blew the horns. And everybody yelled. And the walls came falling down. There was other conquest. Um, but did they actually conquer all of the promised land? No, they should have. They should have, but they didn't. They did but and the, the, the foreigners that ended up staying ended up doing what? Converting them. <laughs> Converting them the wrong way. That's yeah, right. They started to intermingle and intermarry, 
right? Yeah. And, and idolatry. Here we go again. Idolatry. So, they set, set them into the period of the judges. Remember the symbol for judges was the downward spiral. <coughs> Does anybody can tell me what the cycle of, of that downward spiral represents? How everything just... The tagline for judges was uh, there were no there was no king in Israel and everyone did as they pleased. Yeah. We talked about some of the judges. One of the early ones was a woman, Deborah. That was impressive. Um, do you guys remember anything about Deborah's story? Uh, yeah. She wanted to go. Cool. She, she told uh, the uh, leader oh, that right. because, because he wanted to go with him, right. that he wouldn't have the honor yeah. of, uh, of killing the king, the other king. Uh -huh. and, uh, so it best. turned out that the uh, wife of the uh, pagan side uh, drove a stake. That was one of the gorier stories in the yeah. Bible. Yeah. So the yeah. honor of that victory went to a woman just like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was not one he wanted to sleep through. That was a good one. Ten, the tenth fight. Can I ask a question yeah. about just that downward spiral? Uh -huh. What was that? Was that uh, like uh, idol worship? Idol worship. They intermingled and intermarried and they got involved in idol worship. Idol worship. And so God would send foreigners to, to oppress them right. as punishment, and they cry out to God. And he would send a judge, he'd make the enemy go away, and then they'd go right back into it. So it just kept, it just kept repeating itself. Uh, Gideon, Gideon, my favorite. Remember Gideon's story? God sends little old Gideon hiding in the wine press to go fight the Midianites. And he t first he brings the army down from like 32,000 to... 300 and he sends them in the battle holding a trumpet and what else? A, light. a lamp under a pitcher. And what was missing? A weapon. <laughs> but they didn't need that stinking sword. God got it, got won the victory because they, they blew the trumpets, they broke the, the lamps, surprised the Midianites in the middle of the night, and they turned on each other and killed each other. They didn't need the swords after all. Samson. Oh, Samson. He had so much potential. He was so <laughs> Samson's downfall was. <laughs> yes. He was a Nazarite from birth, it means he wasn't supposed to cut his hair or drink wine. He drank wine anyway. Um, but and um, his first marriage didn't work out. And then he met Delilah. And Delilah was in cahoots with the enemy of the Philistines, and she wanted to know how, what was the source of his strength, and they were going to pay her big bucks if, if she could figure it out, and she did. What was the source of his strength? He got his hair. He cut his hair and all the strength left him. So they put out his eyes, and they took him into slavery, and made fun of him, and his hair started to grow back. And just one last thing. The last thing that was probably the, thing, the best thing that he did. He knocked out the pillars and sold more Philistines with his death than he did in his life. Samuel was the last judge, and he was a good trans trans transition. transition, thank you, into kings. God used Samuel to anoint the first two kings of Israel. Saul was the first king, and he looked good, but was he good? No. Yeah. Does anybody remember some of the mistakes Saul made? There were so many. He didn't listen to what he was supposed to do, so he did whatever. He, I think, he, but I think he sacrificed at the altar when he shouldn't have been doing it. He, he, he was a priest. He was a king, but he wasn't a priest. Yeah, he went into the temple. Right. Holy, holy. Saul's problem was, I'm sorry? Didn't he, 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 he did some type of function before they went into battle? Uh -huh. The priest was supposed to do He made the sacrifice, yes. Oh, okay. To God. Basically, whenever things got too hot and he got too antsy, he would do whatever came to mind, even if it was what God told him not to do. Remember, he was supposed to kill all of the enemy, including the livestock, and he did. He saved the king and some of the cows because he wanted to make a, a sacrifice. Oh God, I was doing it for you. Yeah. That's where we get the principle: obedience is better than sacrifice. 
much better than sacrifice. So, God takes the kingdom away from Saul, even while he's still on the throne. He takes the kingdom away by taking his Holy Spirit away. And Saul becomes very troubled. And David comes into his life to sue them. But God has already anointed David as the next king. Remember, he was the little shepherd boy who stood up to Goliath the giant. He was a, a very brave young man. God, God um, anointed him as king even before he was able to take the throne. Saul that knew it and tried to kill him, but he finally lost his own life in battle and David ascended to the throne. And David was a good king, but he wasn't a perfect king. What happened with David? Bathsheba. Women. Women. <laughs> one in particular. One in particular, Bathsheba, that's right. And um, she bore a child as a result of that union who died. That was part of the consequences of, of his sinful action. But they had another child named Solomon. And Solomon was a good king. But. but <laughs> and his problem was four women. Too many women. He had 700 wives, not counting concubines. Uh, and he, he had the honor of building the temple. He had the honor of building the temple, which was a, quite an honor. He also built a palace. Now, Solomon had a child named Rehoboam. And Rehoboam was really disappointed because what happened under his watch? Israel was split. Oh, the kingdom split. The kingdom split, too. And I forgot to teach y'all this last time. Um, when, when Marshall Lavar was teaching in the Senate, she taught us this. We ended up with two kingdoms, right? The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Ten tribes in the northern kingdom. Two tribes in the southern kingdom. Oh, that's cool. The northern kingdom is called Isra Israel. Mm -hmm. yeah. The southern kingdom is called Judah. Judah. And the last one, see if you remember what it is. 0-8. See if you remember that. They, there were no people left in the northern kingdom. No, 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 no that's not what oh. Yeah, you're right. You're right, but this. There were zero good kings oh, okay. in the northern kingdom and only eight good kings in the southern. So it's north, south, Israel, Judah, 10 to 0 8. You remember that? You know a lot about you. You did tell us about Oh, I did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I'm sure I did. That's a little reminder. <laughs> um, so we've got two kingdoms now. And what happens when you divide? The whole army is here to conquer. And that's exactly what happened. Exile. Assyria came and conquered the northern kingdom, took off ten tribes, and they were never heard from again. They're the ten lost tribes of Israel. That was somewhere in the 700 BCs. Then about 125 years later, we have another exile. Babylon comes into the southern kingdom and takes, first of all, the best and the brightest. And Daniel was a part of that group. Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And um, they, they take way back, they take three waves of, of exiles off. Babylon does. They don't take them all at once. They take them over a period of years for three. And the last thing they do is, do you remember what Babylon did that was so awful? They destroyed Jerusalem and demolished the temple. They just, they just raised the city. They took all the stuff back. Yeah, yeah, it was awful. So they took they took the, everything they had, pretty much. And um, the the year the number of years of the exile were seventy. Seventy years of exile. And Daniel and his friends again represent that faithful remnant. We get to hear Daniel's story. Um, there, there were other faithful ones, I'm sure, but we get to follow Daniel's story in a book that bears his name. Um, if I remember anything special about Daniel and his friends. They refused to do to bow down to <coughs> and put them in the lions and they rescued from the punishment. That's right. That's right. For refusing to bow to the idol, it was the fiery furnace, and for for refusing to stop praying to God, it was the lions' den. And they also refused to stop eating from the king's table. Yeah. They refused to eat from the king's <laughs> table. So they tried to be true to who they were as Jews, even though they were under foreign rule. So, Daniel prayed very faithfully for Israel. He, he repented on behalf of the nation and asked God to please deliver them out of exile. And God answered his prayer. And he used, that's where we are now, we're under return. Let me get my, I knew I had a thing. The next section is called return. And the symbol, see if anybody can tell from my excellent artwork, 
Building the bullet wall. That's right. Rebuilding. Rebuilding is the symbol for the return. And the person who let them return was an unlikely deliverer. Do you mind know who it was that let the people of Israel return to their homeland? Cyrus, the Persian king. In fact, God calls him my anointed one. He didn't convert him and then call him his anointed one. He just left him as old Cyrus, the pagan Persian king. But he used him for his purposes. God can use um, anybody for his purposes. So he, he started sending the um, Israelites back to Jerusalem, the ones that were willing to go. Not everybody was willing to go because they've been gone for 70 years. That's like three generations. So there are people born in Babylon and they probably kind of got comfortable. And there really wasn't a whole lot to go home to. Remember, they destroyed Jerusalem. So Cyrus was the great return artist for this. <coughs> and he starts sending them back in waves. And the first wave, I can never pronounce or spell this guy's name. Zerubbabel. Like I said, I can't spell it. Zerubbabel. He led the first he led the first group of, uh, of exiles back to Jerusalem and started the efforts to rebuild the temple. And it took a while. They had some failed starts. But Cyrus sent him back and gave him the material and the resources they needed to rebuild the temple, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. It's got God's fingerprints all over it. So they got the temple rebuilt, and it was nowhere near the splendor of the first temple. Solomon's temple was the pinnacle. This is Zerubbabel's temple. The second one, it was a pale comparison. It just wasn't the same, but it was the best they could do. Another wave of the exiles returned under Ezra, who was a priest. And Ezra, when they were cleaning up and, and restoring the temple, he found the book of the law. And he brought it out and read it to the people. <clears throat> Seventy years they'd been gone. They didn't get to take all their stuff with them. So they're hearing God's law for after 70 years, they're hearing it. And what did they start to do? Does anybody remember? It just worked because they realized how unfaithful they had been to God's law. They hadn't been keeping the feasts or festivals or anything. And so they, God called them back to being his people. Um, the last person who brought a wave of people back was Nehemiah. And Nehemiah's task was to rebuild the city itself, primarily the walls. Um, they were, in some places, they were just torn down, in other places, they were just destroyed. And so he had to take the, the sad little remnant that had come back and use them to build this wall. And they had lots of opposition. At one point, they had to pretty much work with a trowel in one hand and a sword with the other to fight off the opposition. So they get the walls rebuilt, and then they have to repopulate. He's still trying to build it. He can't have the great city of David, Jerusalem, if, you, if there's nobody living in it. It needs to be populated. And the people who had returned didn't return to Jerusalem because there wasn't much there. They went into the outlying areas and started lives, farm, herds, whatever. So he needed to get some people into Jerusalem, and he had a really interesting idea for how to do it. It's kind of like the lottery. Every tenth person <coughs> was, was invited to, to move to Jerusalem. They weren't, they didn't make them. It was, they had to be willing to do this. And it really was a sacrifice. I mean, imagine you've got a nice little spread and you've got your farm and, and your farm animals. You've got to close down that and move into the city. It's a totally different way of life. But fortunately, there were some that were willing to do it. So they moved in and they got Jerusalem repopulated. And so they've got now, they've got their law, they've got the temple, and they've got the law, and they've got the, the city of Jerusalem. This, is, this period in Israel's life is called Second Temple Judaism. And it's, what you have to realize is that the nation that made up the nation of Israel in Jerusalem was tremendously diminished in numbers. First you lost the whole ten tribes of the northern kingdom. And then not everyone of the southern kingdom that had been in exile returned. So you had what's now called the diaspora. They were dispersed. Israel had been dispersed throughout the nation. And so, um, different the, during this time of Second Temple Judaism, you had these sects that developed. Sects, S-E-C-T-S. <laughs> Enunciate. Um, 
that you have probably heard of. One of them is the Pharisees. <coughs> the Pharisees were the nationalistic leaders. They were like the ultra-conservative Jews. Ultra-conservative. They were, they were insistent on keeping the purity of the law, the letter of the law, every little jot and tittle. Um, they, they accepted the idea of the resurrection, and they wanted very much to strengthen their faith with Judaism because it had been diluted by all of these Gentiles and all this idol worship. So they were, these were tended to be from the working class, and they were very, very vigilant in their observation of their faith. The other group was the Sadducees. They tended to be from the upper crust. They were more of the elite. They, they, had, they were wealthy, they had land. And um, so because of their resources and assets, they tried to get along very well with those that were oppressing them because they wanted to protect their interests, right? Um, so they were kind of the more liberal side of Judaism, but they were the more powerful because they were in cahoots with the oppressing nation. Yeah. One of the ways that I learned uh, in this group to, to tell I was just going story, there. Yeah, was uh, the Pharisees believed in the law and they believed in the resurrection. And the Sadducees did not. That's why they were sad to see. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in angels, and that's why they were Sadducees. That's that's what it was. So that's the um, the period of the return. And we're going to keep talking about that as we move into the next section, which is Judaism.
prostitutes, drunkards, <coughs> Gentiles. He hung out with Gentiles. So, in this period of, of Ju Second Temple Judaism, you've got the diaspora, right? Most of, most of Israel is living in other places. Just a small portion is living in Jerusalem. So what happened during this period of time was the synagogue. They developed what was known as the synagogue, which was a house of prayer. If you lived in Babylon or Persia or where, Assyria or wherever you lived, it wasn't going to be very easy to get to the temple. So they needed to develop a way to worship where they were. And that was what the synagogue was. The synagogue was the house of prayer. And instead of priests for the temple, what did they have for the, for the um, synagogues? The rabbis. They were the religious teachers. And does anybody know what they do in synagogue? Yeah. Read the Torah. They read the Torah. They discuss it. They pray. They sing. Does this sound familiar to anybody? There's only one thing missing, and you have Sunday service. Wait, you, you throw Eucharist in there, and you've got Sunday service. Except you know, Jesus Jesus and I sit, and everybody else sit. Yeah. So anyway, the synagogue service reminds us very much of our Jewish roots yeah. because it's centered around, you know, you have the reading of the scripture, you have the explanation of the scripture, you have prayers, you have singing. The only thing different is we have Eucharist. But we don't have Jesus either. We have a Savior. Yeah. And we have, we have Jesus in Jesus. Right. So were they what? Israelites what? up until the point of Judaism Jesus. and then they became oh, Jews? The, 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 the religion of Judaism kind of evolved over, over from Abraham is when it started. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a very much a progressive thing because Abraham didn't have the law, remember? The law only came when Moses came. Yeah. And after Moses, after the law came with Moses and then they, they had all of the trouble with idolatry and the exile and they built in the, um, the extra... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the oral law and, the, and all of their traditions. Um, hand washing. Remember, we talked about that before. They had, you know, certainly you had to wash your hands. And if you didn't do it, you were a sinner. So, a lot of sinners running around there. So, a synagogue, you could have, the, the, the Jewish law allowed you to have a synagogue if there were at least 10 male heads of households. If there was that many in a town, they could form a synagogue. If there wasn't that many, they could meet under a tree near open water, like a lake or a river or a stream or something. That's why when you see Paul traveling on his missionary journeys and he gets kicked out, he, so he, if he it says he goes to a synagogue or he finds somebody worshiping under a tree. I think that's where he met Lydia, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, during this time of Judaism, they'd always... The idea of Messiah is a very interesting thing. I spent most of the afternoon reading Jewish websites about the idea of Messiah. And um, when, when you look at the prophets that talk about a victorious conquering Messiah, but it also talks about another type, suffering Messiah. So some of the Jews were expecting two Messiahs, because it sounded like two different people. I mean, how can you be suffering and victorious? It doesn't make any sense, right? Of course, we know Jesus was well. It was in his suffering and death that he was victorious over sin and death. So but they, they didn't know how to put those together. What they were expecting out of Messiah was mainly the conqueror. Yeah. The, superhero. the superhero, exactly. The guy on the, the, the steed. And um, he wanted, they wanted him to defeat, to defeat the, um, at the point of time, when Jesus comes on the picture, it's the Romans that are oppressing the Israelites. He wants somebody to overcome the Romans, do away with their oppression, <coughs> restore Israel to their glory and splendor like in Solomon's days. That's what they're looking for. That's what they're still looking for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you come right well, back, actually, in some of the websites I saw, they're not really looking for Messiah. They're looking for a Messianic age where there's peace, not necessarily yeah, they're Messiah. Looking, really, they're looking forward to Jesus coming back and bringing that. Oh, we are. I'm sorry. I'm just with you. No, no, we are very we're, much looking forward to that. We're, we're looking for a conqueror to come back and have a new heaven and a new earth, peace on earth. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we're still looking forward to today. Mm -hmm. That's true. Very much so. In John chapter 7, verse 27, 
um, the, the Jews are talking about Jesus. And they say, um, we know where this man comes from. They knew he was born in Bethlehem and raised in Galilee, right? Nazareth, Nazareth. Raised in Nazareth. We know where this man comes from. When the Christ comes, no one will know where he's from. That's one of the reasons that they discounted him, because they knew him. They knew his parents. Um, it was that was a very they, they thought that Messiah would come from unknown origins. That was one of the expectations of the Messiah. Here's some of the other expectations they had. Messiah would be a human being and not divine in any way. He'd be a human descendant of King David, but not, not divine. That was one expectation. Another one would he be an expert in all aspects of Torah and leader of his generation. Jesus could argue we did that. Third one, he would rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Still no temple. Trina and I were there not too long ago. Still no temple. He will gather the Jewish people from all over the world and bring them home to Israel. Still waiting on that to happen. Will cause all the world, both Jew and Gentile, to return to God and his teachings. That would be wonderful. Uh, usher in an era when the Jews are not subject to any other powers, but spend all of their time learning Torah. And the last thing, he would bring peace to the whole world. That's, that's what their expectations were of Messiah. Um, rabbi Moses Maimonides was a 12th century rabbi, a very powerful 12th century rabbi. He wrote a code of Jewish law. And in it, he included this statement about Messiah's identity. Okay? About what? Messiah's identity. If a king arises from the house of David who meditates on the Torah, occupies himself with the commandments as did his ancestor King David, observed the commandments of the written and oral law, prevails upon Israel to walk in the way of the Torah and to follow its direction, and fights the wars of God, it may be assumed that he is Messiah. If he does these things and is fully successful and rebuilds the third temple on its location and gathers the exiled Jews, he is beyond doubt the Messiah. But if he's not fully successful or if he is killed, he is not the Messiah. So that's awesome. Jesus died on the cross. Yes. Three days later, rose again. What do they say about the rising of Christ? They don't believe that? Well, they don't see. Um, the resurrection was something that happened to everybody. The resurrection was something. Everybody gets resurrected. So why would we, why would just one man get resurrected? Yeah, but that, that confused them. But people at the resurrection don't come walking on the earth. And the res when the resurrection happens, all the dead are resurrected. So this one man being resurrected doesn't fit their, their pattern, their model. They don't have a thought for them. So the next se section we're going to talk about is the Messiah. We finally get to Jesus. And his symbol is very familiar. Ross. I mean, they have people that volunteer to be nailed to the cross. To be crucified, I've seen that now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, with the time of Jesus' birth, the Romans were occupying and uh, overpowering the Jews in Israel. And there were over 40 Old Testament prophecies about Messiah that Jesus fulfilled all of them. There were prophecies about his birth. You might know some of those. Well, what are some of the facts about his birth? He was born where? Yeah. That was the fulfillment of a prophecy. What else? The star. The star in the sky. That was another prophecy. And to the three kings. To a virgin. Yes, that was a, another prophecy. Uh, Mary was a teenager, a young unmarried woman, when she became pregnant with Jesus. Um, and that he would be, like we just finished saying, of the house of David, the tribe of Judah. <coughs> All of those were prophecies about Messiah which he fulfilled. There were prophecies about his life, that he would be rejected by his people. The, um, I've already covered it up. The Pharisees rejected Jesus because he didn't, he, he kept God's law, but he didn't, he didn't recognize this wall around it. He kept they, calling him, a, they kept thinking of him as a lawbreaker, but he was breaking the Sabbath. He wasn't breaking the Sabbath, he was just ignoring their man-made rules about the Sabbath. Um, so they didn't, he, he fell into the center category of their 
two-tiered life. The Sadducees rejected him because he was a rabble rouser. He was, he was causing the people to get all riled up, and that was going to upset the Romans. And if the Romans were upset, they might lose their wealth and their position. And they wanted status quo, peace at any price. So somebody mentioned about the Magi coming. That was a prophecy fulfilled. Um, the, Isaiah 35 talks about all the miracles, that he would make the, line, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. Zechariah 9 tells us that he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey. There's also a lot of prophecies about his death, that he would be accused by false witnesses, that he would be betrayed by a friend, that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Psalm 22 that we read on Good Friday, about his hands and feet being pierced, about his um, his um, no broken bones, his side being pierced, yeah. About them um, gambling for his clothes. His clothes not being rent. rent. Yep, yep. And Isaiah 53, that he, his death was an atonement for our sins. He died in our place, in substitution. So, all of these 40 plus prophecies fulfilled in his life and death and resurrection. So we know, we know how his, about his birth, thanks to Luke. Luke tells us a lot about his birth. We don't know much about his childhood. We know that he was visited by the Magi, that his parents took him to Egypt to escape Herod's wrath. He was taken to the temple and dedicated as an infant. Do you remember the two people that met him at the temple at his dedication? Anna and Simeon. Simeon. Um, and they got to see the first child before they died. They were very really old. And there was one other story from his childhood. Do you remember that one? When he stayed in the temple. 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 Talking to the rabbis. Yeah, he got separated from his family and they found him in the temple. His mother was angry at him, but he said that's fine. Didn't even know I would be, be in my father's house. Mm -hmm. Where else would you expect to find him? Um, he worked as a carpenter until about the age of 30 when he went to visit his cousin John the Baptist and got baptized, started his earthly ministry called 12 men to be his disciples. I won't try to ask you to name the 12 disciples because I'm not sure I can. <laughs> but what are some of the disciples' names? Peter, Peter, Peter John, 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 Thomas, 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 Thomas good, James, James Bartholomew, Nathaniel, Judas, 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 yeah. Judas. That's pretty good. It's, it's, there was a Philip in there and a Thaddeus. And he and his disciples traveled through the region of Galilee, <coughs> teaching, preaching, raising the dead, healing, healing delivering. Not so much baptizing. Jesus, Jesus did for his, yeah. his uh, John the Baptist did. Yeah, and or especially and after he was resurrected. Yeah. yeah. And um, I have one of It just jumped out of my head. I said raising the dead. Oh, delivered from demons. He had a powerful uh, ministry of, of deliverance. <clears throat> I guess they could speak many languages too, like, you know, what they got to do. Because there were different dialects. Aramaic and Hebrew and Greek would be the three that I would know of off the top of the head. Yeah. And they probably did speak all three of them. What were yeah. some of the miracles besides the healings and raising the dead? There were other miracles that Jesus did. Water to wine. The fish. There were two fish uh, miracles. Yeah. The money and the fish's mouth, wow. yeah. and, and the miraculous catch. Yeah. They've been fishing all day and didn't get anything. And Jesus goes, Ah, oh, give them more try. Yes. 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 Calming yep. the sea. Twice he fed the multitudes out of a tiny amount of food. Calm the sea. Calm the sea. And did what else with the sea? Walk, 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 walk down the water. Walk down the water. Yep. Um, the Jewish leaders rejected them. Like I said, the Pharisees and the Sadducees each had their reason. But what was their accusation of them? What was, what was, what was their charge? Blasphemy. He blasphemy. says he is the king of Jews. He says he is the son of God. That's the blasphemy. That's right. and, that, and, if, and if he said it and it weren't true, it would have been blasphemy. But it was true. And they, they wanted him gone. And so they take him to Pilate, the Roman governor. governor and what does Pilate think? Hey, he was a big deal. I, I don't see any fault. Exactly. But the, people, but the people insist. And they say, if you don't crucify him, you're no friend of Caesar's. And he gets nervous. And he pulls a saw. And gets nervous and, and does something to please the people around him. And he 
has them executed. But didn't he send them someplace else? The parrot. He sent them to Herod. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So he had him beaten, and the beating alone should have killed him. It's, if anybody saw the Passion of the Christ, it probably was even worse than that. I can't even imagine the horror. Um, and then they took him broken and bloodied like that and, and nailed him to a cross and hung him between two thieves. And while he was hanging there, they gave him to his clothes. And um, they put a sign over his head. He of the Jews. They put it in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, which is kind of interesting. All three languages. And their Jewish leaders said, no, you should put, he claimed to be the king of the Jews. And he said, what I've written, I've written. So it was very accurate. It was meant to be a mockery, and it turned out to be a very accurate statement. Um, what was Jesus' last word on the cross? It is finished. He also said some other things. Why have you forsaken me? There's one in particular. Into your hands I command my spirit. What was yours, Bob? Forgive them. They know that what they did. And then he amazing. Then he told them. Which was I don't know what the was he told John. Oh, he would he would see him in there. Yeah, the, the two thieves on the cross. One was mocking him, and the other one says, well, "Are you crazy? We're we're getting what we deserve. This man's done nothing." And Jesus said, "Today you'll be with me in paradise." He also told the apostle John to take care of his mother. So even in agony, he was doing a lot of teaching and communicating in those final moments. And finally, he did surrender his spirit and died. What happened when he died? Curtain, 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 the holy. And what does that, what does that represent? That was a huge. It was that opening up the, uh, the holy of holies to everybody. 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 Yeah. Before that, you had to have a mediator between you and God. Yeah, that's right. the right. temple was open. But now, there's no, we don't have to have a mediator because Jesus took our sin. It's dealt with. We can enter into the Father's presence. There was also there was the sky with the ark. The sky was the ark. The ark. Yeah. Um, that's why the temple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, they took him down off the cross and were surprised he was dead so soon. And took him down the cross and they laid him in a borrowed tomb. Do so you remember the name of the man who gave the tomb? Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea gave the tomb for him to be buried in. And three days later, he rose again. He rose again. The tomb was empty. You may not realize there were quite a few, of maybe at least ten, post resurrection appearances of Jesus before he ascended into heaven. He appeared at least ten times that we know about. The first time, of course, was right there at the tomb to the, to the women. Uh, Mary Magdalene had gone back. And she's trying to figure all this out. She'd gone to, to get his body ready with spices and, and the tomb's empty. And, she, and Jesus meets her. And she thinks he's the gardener. She doesn't recognize him immediately at first. And he calls her name. And she immediately recognizes him. And she throws herself at him. Um, so what do you see? He it's a good movie, but I don't think that happened. Okay. But Peter and John were the two disciples who came running to the tomb, and they find it empty, and they're headed back, and Jesus appears to them and says, go and tell my disciples, and I'll meet them in Galilee. But didn't he tell them not to touch him at that time? Yeah. Just, don't cling to me. Don't yeah. cling to me. I have, I have, I have one or two. To my father, yeah. yeah. He, he, um, he appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They didn't know who he was. And so they turn around and go back to Jerusalem, and they're like, um, we're not quite sure what's going on. He appeared to Peter alone. But they weren't the two that he appeared to, interestingly enough, were the apostles. They were, they were not the 12 apostles. They, they were, were some other followers. They were disciples, yeah. But they weren't uh, apostles. I always found that rather interesting because they, they, would say, yes, they weren't the Thomas. Thomas. Well, he appeared to all the disciples together except Thomas. And then he comes back and Thomas gets a chance. Yeah. Then he fixes them breakfast on the beach. Remember yeah. that one? Yeah. 
cooks fish for him. We're told by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 that he appeared to more than 500, which is really surprising. That's a big deal, and yet none of the gospel writers recorded it. So I'm glad Paul told us, because that's the only way we know about it. And then in Acts 1-3, it says, He presented himself to alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So there could have been other appearances that we just don't know about. And then, of course, the final one was at the ascension, when he ascended into heaven. And he will return. Like Barbara was saying, we celebrate the fact that he will one day return in glory. But in the meantime, where is he? Right, 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 right hand of the Father. And what is he doing there? He's interceding, He's interceding for us. Absolutely. And he'll return to judge the living and the dead and to claim his own. Um, I found this one statement that I'll close with. Five whole minutes. A while. Um, anyway, here's this last statement I want to um, share with you. I don't know who wrote it. Jesus outshone Adam in obedience, Abraham in trust, Joseph in faithfulness, Moses in prophetic power, Joshua in strength, Samuel in steadfastness, David in royal might, and Solomon in glory. We talked about all those people. And Jesus, of course, just far outshines them all. So, can you tell that he was the son of God? Yes, yes. So we've got just two more sections left. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit coming and then the last things. So, when we come back next week, we'll finish the timeline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.